Okay, this is Christian Bible Chapel. Welcome back to our uh, adult Sunday school class, wherein our high schoolers and and uh, adults come together. We're, we're studying Christology, and uh, let's put that on the board. If you got your notes, turn to page uh, five in section six. You're going to see six things. We're going to write them on the board for you that do not have your notes. Right? We're dealing with Christology. All right. Christology is the study of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And we're going through each two phases of the meaning, the person of Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ. Right now we're dealing with the person. And one of the person in dealing with, we're dealing with number six. We're dealing with the abilities or attributes, should it be, proving he is God. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's called Christology. Yeah. Oh. And you said page what? Yeah, number six, up in the top left hand corner there, you see session okay. six, and we're going to turn to page five. We're going to okay. deal with uh, the, these six um, key abilities or attributes root, root, proving that Jesus is God. All right? So, number one, okay. He is eternal, and we're going to give you the scriptures. That's Isaiah 9 and 6. Let me just go ahead and write all of these on the board, and that way I don't have to stop anymore and write them. Okay. Uh, number two, he is unchangeable. Malachi, okay, three and six, and Hebrews, one, eight through twelve, and thirteen and eight. Number three, he is omnipresent. Okay, scripture for that is Matthews. 18 and 20, and Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, number um, 4, he is omnipotent, okay, Philippians 3, uh, 20, Revelations 1 and 8. Right. Okay, number 5. He is perfect. That's in Colossians 1, 9, 2, 9, 10. And the last one is he is in come prehense Big word there, right? All right. Isaiah nine and six fifty-five eight and nine New Testament and Hebrews. 11, 27, and Romans 11, 33, 36. Now, I took the time to write all this on the board, just in case you who are watching do not have your notes. You haven't sent away for it yet. And we're looking at the attributes proving that Jesus is God. 
Now, of course, we're not going to cover all the scriptures. There's many things Jesus did uh, while he was on earth that proved that he is God. All right? Um, as you, especially if you, if you want to really look at these series of studies of scriptures that's proven that, begin reading St. John chapter 1 and work your way all the way up to chapter 20. I mean, all-inclusive right there is everything Jesus did, the places that he went to, the things that he did, his acts, all of that prove that he is God, okay? And that's the whole point, to prove that he is God. All right, so let's, let's look at number one. All right, let's look at number one, and I'll, and I'll on the board on page five. And it says, he is eternal. Turn your Bibles to the Old Testament. And we look in Isaiah oops, chapter 9 and verse 6. Many, uh, many people do not look at Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 until Christmas time. <laughs> but we're going to look at it right now because this itself proves that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is God. Let's read Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And of course that's what? The birth of Jesus, right? The well, birth of the Messiah, which is Jesus. Okay? That's that's obvious because you can't get around it. Alright? The government shall be upon his shoulders his name shall be called Wonderful. Now, Isaiah is going to list names that is given to the Son, all right, that is given. It, it, it's names given to the child that is born. One of the names is Wonderful. Another name, Counselor. Another name, Mighty God. Another name, Everlasting Father. Next, Prince of Peace. Now, if this doesn't let us know that the babe that was born in Bethlehem of Judea grew up to be Jesus, if this doesn't prove that he is God, I, you know, um, uh, I think a uh, 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 scale is over people's eyes. Okay, His name should be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And it goes on and says, the increase of his government, all right, and peace shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon the kingdom, to order it and to establish it with just judgment and with justice from henceforth ever forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So, Jesus Christ is the eternal God, according to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Let's turn into the New Testament. Right. First John chapter 5 and verse 11. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. So eternal life eternal is part of the attribute of the son. All right? Let's look at number two. He is unchangeable. The Messiah, Jesus Christ. All right? He is unchangeable. In other words, he cannot change. You cannot change him because you pray. That does You can't change God's mind. You can't change God's will. You can't change God's work. So the phrase, you often hear the phrase, prayer changes things. It does not. Because if you say you can pray and change God, then that means you have some ounce or pound or whatever you want to say of omniscience or sovereignty in yourself. Prayer doesn't change things. You do not see that in scriptures. We are so used to saying it that we honestly believe it. All right? That comes from the word of faith movements and many of the charismatic teachings that all you got to do is pray. That's, that's their definition of whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, I will do it. 
So you ask, it's done. Now, Douglas, in our children's lesson this morning, earlier, he talked about that. It's not saying that, Lord, I need an Xbox, or Lord, I need a car, and boom, it's right there. Whatsoever you ask the Lord, he will do it. No, the scripture doesn't mean that. We want it to, but it doesn't mean that. We have no solvent power over God to demand Satan God, angels, to do what we say because we pray and we end it in Jesus' name. All right? We got to be careful of the teaching of the Word of God. So he is unchangeable. Let's turn to the last book of the English Bible, Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. That's before the beginning of the New Testament. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Also is in the book of Samuel. Well, let's look at Malachi here. For I am the Lord, Jehovah. I change not. I am the Lord, Jehovah. I change not. It is. Okay. Now, to prove that, see, then you got to say, well, that's talking about God, Jehovah. Okay, now. Malachi 3 6 is compatible to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8 and following. So let's go to the New Testament. Any questions? Hebrews chapter 1. So that ain't the scriptures speak. There we go. Mal Hebrews chapter 1, starting at verse 8. For unto the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God. Now, I, I, I'm hesitating in reading because my eyes was glancing back uh, to verse uh, 5 before we even get to verse um, verse 8 because I, I spotted something as I was reading. That's why I was hesitant. So let's go back to verse 5 to bring 5 up to connect to verse 8. Now, you got to remember, the book of Hebrews was written to the Judeans, the Jews at that time, to let them know that the Messiah, who is Jesus, is better than angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than the high priest. He's better than Melchizedek. He's better than the patriots. He's better than the sanctuaries. He's better than the offerings and sacrifices. That's what Hebrews is all about. Christ is better. All right? Notice in verse 5, Hebrews 1 and 5. For unto which of the angels... See, now from verses 1 and following, it's going to discuss the compar comparative between angels and Jesus, the Messiah. Because you know our Jehovah Witness friends and Mormons they believe Jesus is either a higher angel or a creative being. But the scripture says in verse 5, for unto which of the angels, after all the millions of angels that God made, created, he says, which of the angels did he at any time say unto them, you are my son? Now, if Jesus is an angel, or on the same level with Michael and Gabriel as archangels, or as the Mormon says, Jesus is the son of Lucifer, which Lucifer is a powerful angel, or the Jehovah Witness says that Jesus is a creative being because of their misunderstanding of St. John 1 and Philippians chapter 2, they had no understanding of it. Then why does the scripture says, out of all the angels, it says, verse 5, for unto which of the angels that God created now said he at any time, you are my son, this day have I begotten thee. See, that word begotten, see there in verse 5, Hebrews uh, 1 and 5? You see that? The word begotten there has nothing to do with being born. In our English dictionary, it does mean that. 
but in the Greek meaning, comparative to the Hebrew, it means a position, an inheritance. Okay, you follow me? Have I begotten thee? I have put you on a, a level, a standard, an inheritance, not compared to any angel or man. That's what the word, I begot thee. And again, he said, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, verse 6, when he brings in the first begotten into the world, he says all, that all the angels worship him. See, all what God has created, the angels, right? And man, let both angel and man know that Jesus is higher than them. He is, I am he. His position, his inheritance is above them. Let all the angels worship him. And of the angels, he says, he makes his angel spirits, his ministers, a flaming fire. But unto the Son, he says, thy throne, O God. Now, this is what he's saying. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thy kingdom come. See that? So that goes along with Malachi 3 and 6, that he is unchangeable. He is forever and forever. All right? He does not change his mind. Uh, we also got on the board Hebrews 13 and 8. Let's turn to that real quick. There's a misunderstanding of this verse because the scripture says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. What people like to tend to believe, and they, they want to use this scripture, it says, what he did to the Old Testament, he does in the New. But this is not what that scripture is talking about. He's not telling us to build a ark. He's not telling us to sacrifice animals. All right? He's not telling us to cross the Red Sea. You, you can't apply that. All right? He's, he, he doesn't feed us manna from heaven. All right? Okay? We can't strike the rock and, and water come out of it like he did to the Israelites. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's unchangeable. He's the same yesterday in the Old Testament. He's the same today, and he is the same forevermore. Okay? Those are our two texts. And number two, he is unchangeable. Right? Any questions? Now, the next one, number three, he is omnipresent. The word omni, see this word, the root word here? See that? That means all. He's all present. He's everywhere. All present. Omnipresent. Omnipresent. He's everywhere. That's what that scripture is. All right? Now, to prove that, we... I know we're shuffling around here because we're using scriptures to prove uh, what we're talking about. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, turn to that. I'll give you time. In Matthew chapter 18 and 20, it's going to show that Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is everywhere. Now, you, you're thinking, well, he's in Judea. I mean, he, he's, uh, you know. In his physical form, when he was on earth as the son of man in a physical body, no, Jesus was right there in Jerusalem. He couldn't be in, other, in Samaria at the same time in Judea in that human form. So we look at Jesus in the scriptures and see that once he rose from the dead, all right, he says in Matthew chapter 18 and 20, let's read what it says here. Matthews 18 and 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So he's with us here in Sunday school class, 
you that are sitting here, you that is on the social media watching us, you that's on the phone, you are, you, he, he's with us all. Right? In spirit, he's with us. All right? Okay? So that's, that's what that, that scripture is saying. But actually, when the church comes together to discipline a brother or sister that has fell into sin or refused to acknowledge their sin, and still wants to be a member of the church. When the church comes together and say to this brother or sister, your membership is no longer in force because you're living in sin, you're doing this and you're doing that, and you say you are Christian. You cannot continue being a member of this church. Now, if you repent of your sin and turn from that sin, then your membership will be restored. Until then, no. That's what this chapter 18 here, this portion of chapter 18 is talking about. And it's saying that when the elders agree on that particular discipline of a believer in the church, Jesus is saying, whatever decision you make, I'm with you in that. That's what it says, where two or three are gathered together in, in my name, um, I'm in the midst. Now, I know <laughs> for a long time, people are believing that uh, what this scripture says is that if you're in a church or you're in a gathering, you got two or three people, uh, Jesus in the midst. Well, that may be true, but that's not what this scripture is saying. All right? The thought of saying, believing that is true, because when two believers or three, even you by yourself, Jesus is with you. So it doesn't really take two or three. You can be in your bedroom reading the scriptures, and the Holy Spirit can reveal the truth of the scriptures to you, Jesus is with you because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. But that's not what this passage of scripture is talking about. What this passage of scripture is dealing with is that uh, the believers, uh, the elders in the church, when they make a decision towards a disciplinary Christian in the, in the, in the assembly, that Jesus is saying, whatever decision you make, I agree with that. I'm with you on that. Right. Okay? That's number, uh, what, number three. Right. Number four, he is omnipotent. Again, the word omni means what? All. Potent means powerful. He is all powerful. He is all powerful. Satan is not all powerful. He's, he's powerful, but he's not all powerful. Satan, the devil, the demons get their power and from God. They cannot do, participate into anything unless they ask permission from God. This is taught both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God grants Satan and demons the privilege to do certain things, to carry out certain things. If God didn't want them to do it, they couldn't do it. God would never allow a demon to possess a Christian, a child of God. That can never take place. But to an unbeliever, it's possible because they're not God's child, number one. All right? So Jesus Christ is on the opponent. He's all-powerful. All right? And the scripture lets us know in Matthew, I don't have it there. Do I have it there? I don't have it on the board, but Matthew chapter 28 says, all power, Matthew 28, 18, all power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So the power that is in heaven, the right to exercise it, whether it's in heaven or on earth, Jesus says, I have it. Turn your Bibles to Philippians, uh, New Testament, Philippians chapter 3. Uh, verses what? 20 and 21. That's Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, 21. Okay. For our living or our conversation is in heaven. From whence we look for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies that it may be 
change like his glorious body according to the working where it, where, whereby he is able even to subdue all things. So he is in complete control. He is omnipotent, means that he is in complete control. He has all power. The sun cannot shine without God saying, shine. All right? The sun cannot set, as we know the word set, cannot go down, or the sun doesn't really go down, but that's a figure of speech that we use. But the sun cannot be set or go down unless God wills it. You cannot take the next breath unless God wills it. Now, there's what, 3.5 billion? I don't know how many people on this earth. Every person is breathing by the permissive will of God. Every person's heartbeat is beating because God wills it. Every plant, every bee is flying around. Every frog that is in the pond Every lion that is walking in the in the in the in the, in the, in the wilderness, right? every snake that is crawling, every bird that's flying, their wings cannot flap unless God wills it. Everything He's subdued. He's His power is operating, controlling every everything, every molecule, right? Everything seen and in, uh, unseen, visible and un, invis, uh, uh, visible. The power of God is regulating everything. All things are by him and for him. He is in control of everything. By everything, all things exist by Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, St. John chapter 1. Okay? So, he is omnipotent. That's who Christ is. Okay? All powerful. Now, Revelations, we don't want to skip that one. In Revelations chapter 1, let's go there in the book of Revelations. Of course, you know that's in the back of the Bible. Okay. Listen to what it says. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, this right here, you, remember, now, you know John is writing about Jesus, right? Now, this right here, in Isaiah, here is also recorded again in the Old Testament. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 48, you read it again, which Jehovah saying, I am the first and the last. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. I am the first, I am the last. I am Alpha, I am Omega. In the Old Testament, Jehovah God, numerous of times, declares that he is Alpha and Omega. He's the first and the last. Here in Revelations chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus, John declares that Jesus is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. He is, he was, to come, the Almighty. All right? So, he is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. All-powerful. Right? He is everywhere on the present. He is everywhere. If you want to make further notes on that, uh, in number what? What number are we on? Number four is also in Revelations 22 and 6. I, Jesus, have sent my angels. This is Revelations 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to signify or testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Now again, this is back to Isaiah in which Jehovah is saying he is what? 
the bright, he's the offspring of David. He is the bright and morning star. As far as God incarnate his virgin birth, all that associated with Jesus Christ. Wow, he's the bright and morning star. Again, in the book of Isaiah. He's the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 44 and 6. He's the Lord of hosts. Not Lord of the earth, Adoniah, but he's Lord. He's Lord. He is Lord of hosts, which is Yahweh. That's the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh. That's the Lord God Jehovah. The other Lord, which is capital L, small O R D, see the difference now, means Eponiah, which is teacher or master. Sometimes you read in the scriptures in the Old Testament that the all cap Lord is in front of God, and then sometimes it's the, Lord, it's the large cap L with the small O R D is in front of God. Okay? He is the Lord God. He is the Lord Jehovah God. This is the this is the uh, distinction in when you read those words, Lord and Lord. Adonijah Lord and Yahweh, which is Lord. Okay. And that's why I can't understand why these preachers and on TV and Facebook and churches are saying that they are God. I mean, how can these guys and women say there's a speck of God, there's an ounce of God, or I am God? You know, I mean, this guy, Furtick, and many others, you know, uh, sell a dollar and, and all, they, they're just saying, I'm God, I'm God. Why? And yet, the scripture says, I am God, I am he. I, there is no other God. I am God alone. I am Alpha Omega, the first and the last. There is no other God. Now let me make note of this in the Old and in the New Testament. You're going to come across a verse that says, ye are gods. That phrase there, gods, small g-o-d-s, you're going to, Jesus quoted, and he's quoting it from the Old Testament as well. What that means is, if you look at the context in which Jesus is talking, it, 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 it distinguished in the Greek or in the Hebrew, it means judges. Because a judge can decide life or death for a person and the situation, he, he decides the situation in a person's life. It's, it's a judge that does that because there's only one God. But there is a judge of all judges, the king of kings, lord of lords. Okay, which is which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Now the names, there are several arguments to prove the deity of Jesus Christ. His names are just one of them. Right. We so far have been talking about his attributes and his abilities. Jesus at one point as we see in the scriptures, the Pharisees, when remember when Jesus says that I am a father of one and, and another occasion in which he says uh, God is his father and different occasions in which he does things and say, uh, I am God, I am he, uh, before Abraham was, I am. See, when, when the Pharisees were thinking in their hearts, how can this man say he is God? Isn't he the son of Joseph? Now, the scripture says that Jesus perceived in their minds that they were talking about him in their mind. Now, God only can read the minds. See, all this seances, mind readers, seven sense that they can read minds is fake, is phony, it's not real. Only God can see the hearts the minds of people, which proves that Jesus uh, is God. The next one we're looking at is number five, 
He is perfect. Jesus Christ is perfect. Now, I know that you have even people in church, they say as early people in the early days as well as today, that Jesus it was is capable of sinning. Um, he sinned either on the cross, before the cross, he sinned. And you got some of these guys and women on TV and radio and social media saying that. Uh, they don't believe in the Im impeccability of Jesus Christ. The word impeccable means not able to sin. He knew no sin. There was no sin in him. That's why it was important that the seed that pregnated Mary wasn't from Joseph, but was from God. Because had Joseph had uh, slept with Mary and produced a baby, then that baby would have a sin nature, which having a sin nature, you couldn't become the savior. So that's why it's called the sinless virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Right? And a lot of preachers, and they, they, they simply don't want to um, accept that, but he is perfect. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Colossians. Let's turn our Bibles to the Colossians after Philippians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He is perfect in understanding, perfect in will, perfect in wisdom. Jesus Christ. Right? He is the perfect, perfect God. Look at chapter 2, uh, verse 9 through 10. Right? Actually, verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ is the full representation of God. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. Lord, show us the Father. It suffices us. Philip, have not I yet been long with you? And you say, show us the Father. You have seen the Father. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. He is perfect. Perfect God. Perfect man. He is God-man. That's why he's God-man. He's called the titles that he's given is Son of God. God in flesh. He's perfect. Let's take it a little bit further. Number six. Jesus, or he is incomprehensible. You cannot understand God. His ways is past finding out, the scriptures says here in, in the scriptures. You can't understand the mind of God. You can't understand God. If we fully understood God in his full capacity, in this human flesh, I think we will be better than God because since we're human and have the comprehensiveness to believe to not believe, but to understand God, that makes us either on an equal level of God or a notch above God. And that cannot be. Cannot be. Jesus is incomprehensible. We already looked at Isaiah 9 and 6. Unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I think Isaiah uh, 55. Let's go back to, turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, because we're going to uh, stay there for a while. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter, uh, uh, look at some passages of scriptures in Isaiah, in the 40-some chapters of Isaiah. Right? So, 
hope you're following me. Okay. In Isaiah, let's start at Isaiah 44 as we work our way down to verse chapter uh, 48. Okay, Isaiah. Verse 8, Isaiah 44 and 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told you from the time and have declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So, uh, 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 so a human uh, humor right there. I know not any. I don't know. Look at verse 23. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout your power, oh, excuse me, ye lower parts of the earth. Break Forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree wherein. For the Lord hath redeemed Israel, Jacob, and glorified himself in Israel. Verse 40, verse 24, Isaiah 44, 24. Thus says the Lord, thy Redeemer. You see that? Je Je Thus says Jehovah, the Redeemer. He that formed you from the womb, from the womb, so that means you're in your mother's womb, whatever process it took you to be first initiated life until you are born, you come out, he says, I form you. Every step of the way, from the seed of the woman matching the seed of the man, and you know, it came together and, 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 it, and it produced a child. And from that point all the way up to the birth, God says, I formed you in every way. If you look in, the, in, a, in a book, you see how uh, a baby is, is in pregnancy, how it began, and as it developed as a baby until it comes out on the ninth month. This is what Isaiah says. I form you from the womb. I am the Lord that makes all things that stretch forth the heavens alone and spread aboard the earth by myself. Look at uh, chapter 45, verse 5. I am the Lord. There is none else. There is no God besides me. I girt thee, though you have not known me. Verse 7. I form the light, created darkness. I make peace, create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Of course, the word create there in the Hebrew is cause and effect, allows it, allows. Go to chapter um, 46, 46, and we see in verse 9, remembering, uh, yeah, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. The word God in our English translation, I don't know if you knew this or not, the word God is a plural name. Word God in English is a is, is plural, right? and every time you say the word God, it it speaks of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's plural. Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasures. Now, my eyes are scheming. Um, 
searching here in chapter 8, 48, because it is in 48 when Jesus, uh, God is saying that I am, uh, I am the first and the last, and I'm the beginning and the end. So he's talking about Jesus. He is incomprehensible. And then we see in uh, 55 through our notes, did you see that on the board? Yeah, 55 and verse 8 and 9. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's important. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9 says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as heaven are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So our thoughts and our minds is deeply below. I mean, cannot even be measured according to the thoughts in the mind of God. Okay? That's Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. Extraordinarily, let's turn to Romans chapter 11. I said extraordinary because of the way Paul is writing here in chapter 9 of Romans. And you see here in uh, chapter 9, he says, oh, chapter, chapter 11, I'm sorry, chapter 11 of Romans. Uh, verses 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of riches and both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who have known the mind of the Lord or who have been his counselor or who have first given to him and it shall be recompensed to him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. That is, that is so, God is so incomprehensible. This, this is, and, and it's Jesus Christ. We're talking about Jesus. Okay. Now I got one more before we close. It's not on the board. It should be seven. Um, God is omniscience. Let me let me put that on the board. Number seven. He is om omniscience. I think that's a C there. Did I spell that right? Did I spell it right? C I Burnett. I want to get this right. E N. I think that's right. Okay. But the meaning to the word omniscience means that he knows everything. Omni. All. He knows all. All right. And that's in John. Put it here so we can see it. That's in John's Gospel, chapter 2. And that's in verse 30, 23 to 25. I'm going to repeat that. That's the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 23 and 25. Let's, let's turn that as you write that down. I'll, I'll repeat that. John 2, 23 and 25. In the Gospel of John, he is omniscience. He knows all. You may want to correct that word there, omniscient. I didn't spell it right, okay? But it means to know all. He, he knows all things as God, as Jesus is God. He knows all things. Here it is. John's Gospel, chapter um, 2, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, the feast day, Many believed in his name when, he, when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. Now, why didn't you would think 
well, Lord, they believed on you. Why didn't you commit yourself to them? Because their belief is a false belief. Like many people today in church, they believe in God, they believe in the cross, they believe in salvation, but they have a false belief, a false understanding. They don't believe. Whether they believe through their feelings, their emotions, they believe through intellect or whatever, it's not a true belief. And this is what is talking about here when he says that many believe in his name. You would think once a person believed in the name of Jesus, it's okay, but that you got thorns of people, thousands of people sitting under these false churches, false prophets in within churches and religion. They have a mental belief. They have an emotional belief. But their belief is not from the heart. Because if a belief is from the heart, it changes them. That's where transformation, conversion happens. Belief in the heart causes transformation and conversion to salvation. And it produces results in holiness and righteousness. Because the new person becomes, that old person becomes new. But so it's evident that these people believe with their intellect or believe with the emotions. It's like the parable of the sower that went forth to sow seeds. Another passage of scripture I didn't put on here. Uh, go back. Uh, you can write it down. Then we'll, we'll close out. Mark. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Now, Jesus is, uh, in order to get the understanding of what's going on here uh, in chapter 2, um, someone was brought before Jesus to be healed. They came to him and they brought one who is sick of the palsy. Uh, and no, not Ruth, Mark. I'm sorry, did I say Ruth? <laughs> Mark. Huh? Oh, the man on the roof? Oh, okay, yeah, that's in verse one and two. Okay, but it's 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 sort of like the same story that Matthew told and Luke told. Remember, Peter was having a, a, a gathering in his house for Jesus. I don't know if this is the same episode. And they brought somebody to Peter's house, but the crowd, they couldn't get into the house. They couldn't get through the door because there were so many people. So they, they, they hiced them up on top of the roof and broke the roof open. And, and it was Peter's house. And they lowered him down. You know, they lowered him down at that time to, to get healed because they... They say if Jesus could just touch him, like the woman with the issues of blood, okay, this is that. This may be that same episode. But anyway, they came to him, and in verse 4, when they could not come unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof. Yeah, this is where it is. And they broke it up and let the man down in the bed. When Jesus saw their faith, verse 5, this is Mark 2 and 5, he said to the sick of the palsy, son, Thy sins be forgiven you. That's all Jesus said. I mean, you know, your sins. So obviously, the, whatever sickness this man, you know, had due to his palsy, it was due to his sinning. Right? And he says, Thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes, verse 6, sitting there, reasoning in their hearts. So they, they, they heard Jesus say, man, your sins are forgiven you. Now these scribes, a scribe is a person that, uh, he's a master and he's a writer and a teacher of the, uh, and interprets the law. That's what a scribe does. Now in his teachings, in his learning, he's been taught as a scribe that no one can forgive sin but God. 
Now, that's ironic since why do people still go to the church and seek forgiveness from their pastor or from the priest in the booth? I don't understand that. I mean, it's, it's right there. Even the scribes in Jesus' day knew that you can't go to a man to get forgiveness of sin. I don't think people see that. They don't read the scriptures. They just take people's words. So they go to church and go into this booth or room or whatever and say, Father, I have, I have sinned. Forgive me. Then the priest says, uh, you know, whether it's a mortal sin or it's a, what kind of sin it is, and you got to do penance and you got to do whatever penance you do, you're going to do it as a Catholic. I don't care if you got to crawl on your knees a hundred times back and forth from the beginning of the building with the door to the altar. If that's going to forgive your sin, you'll do it. If it is to get money, if it is to say holy, 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 or to say the rosary five times, holy Mary, mother of God, blessed is fruit of your womb, holy Mary, mother of God, blessed is or it, rolling the beads. See, people do not realize that forgiveness of sin is only through Jesus and not a man. The scribes knew this. So they say in verse 7, why does this man speak blasphemy? So why do people get upset with me or anybody else when they say the priests in Catholic churches, in any church or pastor, any person that goes to a pastor or a priest, and say, forgive me, can you can for you can you forgive my sins? Can you, you know, that's blasphemy. So they get mad at us, but don't want to get mad at the priests. It's blasphemy. Here it is. Why does this man speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? Immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reason within themselves. He says to them, why do you reason these things in your hearts? See, the word hearts and spirit is the same here in the scripture. They were reasoning in their heart. Verse 8, Jesus proceeded in his heart. He read their minds. Why are you thinking this? So, Jesus is omniscient. He can read minds. He knows what you are thinking. And that's all the billions of people on this earth. And see how in a couple of months, it's going to be Christmas. Parents is going to teach their children about Santa Claus. He knows when you're asleep. He knows when you're awoke. He knows when you're bad or good. Be good for goodness sake. You better watch out. You better. So what is happening is that St. Nicholas is on the same level with Jesus. He's omniscient. He knows. Jesus says, omniscience. I know. I'm omniscient. I know. So who is truth and who is a lie? We're easy to believe in fables, myths, and all that than to take in the truth of God's word. So let's recap before we close. Going backwards. He is omni omniscience. Now I'm Number, number seven, he is incomprehensible. He is perfect, omnipresent, om, omnipotent, excuse me, omnipresent. He is unchangeable. He is eternal. These are just a few of the attributes or abilities that prove that Jesus is God. Right. Now, continue reading your notes. I mean, it's about uh, you know, uh, the notes. Typed up is about 27 pages, and uh, you can uh, read that. But for you that do not have your notes, uh, reread and, and study this because these are the abilities or the attributes that's proving that Jesus is God. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you uh, for the word of God. We bless your name and we thank you now. Uh, we pray, Father, that insight of your word as you being eternal, unchangeable, omnipresent, omnipotent, perfect, incomprehensible, and omniscience is so powerful and much more 
We pray, Father, that we will continue to study the Word of God through the understanding of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, that concludes our Sunday School lesson, and we're going to come back at, at 11.30 U.S. time. If you have been across the country, it'll probably be about, what, 5.30 in the evening in Africa of sort, that, that we're coming back to uh, bring forth the Word of God in our second phase, second part of life or death. And we'll be dealing with the words of Jesus, dealing with life and death. Join us at 11.30. God bless. Okay, guys, we'll call you back, and you that are here, we'll uh, take a break right now and uh, be uh, back at 11.30, okay? All right. All right.